All right, Zig coming in on the top. Today on the show, we have Mark Cousins. Mark is someone I greatly admire and someone I'm truly inspired by. Mark has this way of highlighting the margins, bringing the positive out of negative space, and making you see things in a new light that you wouldn't have maybe been even aware of before. We live in a vast, ever-changing, visually exciting world that's moving fast and quickly, such as time is. And it's hard to stop and really appreciate what we're looking at while we're moving. And when you decide to, you see a whole story that can be brought out in a simple image. And for me, the person that inspired me to look in that way was Mark Cousins. With his films and writings and seminars, he brought to my attention a whole story that's been right in front of me that I don't think I could have seen before. And I know I'm not the only one. Mark's works have been a huge influence, especially on the friends around me, the peers I work with, one of which joins me for this conversation, Gabriel Xavier, musician and filmmaker, and someone who's been one of my dear friends for a very long time. And I'm glad we got to share this moment in this conversation with Mark. Also joining us spiritually and digitally was the drummer in my band, um, Pat Boland, who uh, was supposed to be with us during this conversation, but due to the insanity and short notice of the day, wasn't able to. But we got his questions in. If somehow you listened this far and didn't know who Mark Cousins is, Mark Cousins is a northern Scottish filmmaker and writer. His book, The Story of Film, was published around the world. It became a 930-minute film called The Story of Film and Odyssey. Michael Moore gave it the Stanley Kubrick Award, and it won a fair amount of other awards and has been a huge influence on film education since. Mark has a vast and inspiring filmography, but most recently he has put out four films, one called The Story of Jeremy Thomas, The Story of Looking, My Name is Alfred Hitchcock, and March on Rome. I highly recommend Mark's most current works as well as everything else that came before, as well as his multiple books. Mark has his way of describing scenes in a way that's not just like a cinematic look at it, but also an emotional and also philosophical and scientific and historical lens that he describes the beauty in the story of what's going on. This conversation was in the works for a year, maybe a little over a year, going back and forth, trying to line up a time, which I always find super inspiring because the person you're inspired by is busy doing inspiring things. And that's the way it should be. Um, but we landed a time. And uh, before, we, we kind of set out a goal to uh, see where music and film overlap and where they long to touch. So during this conversation, we kind of go back and forth to those points a lot. A few other notes before we get into this conversation. If you're new to this podcast and you are listening to this banter and you're like, oh, I, I think that might be interesting musically, I play in a band called C-Level, letter C-Level. We're a high-energy funk-punk reggae rock group based out of Cleveland, Ohio. It takes 12-string guitars and runs them through Marshall amplifiers to make uh, crazy sounds. And we just put out a record called Think For Yourself, available now on all streaming platforms. So if you're digging this verbally, maybe musically, you're in inquired, check it out. Also, if you can like, rate, review, subscribe to the podcast on any of the podcast platforms, it helps me keep talking to cool guests like Mark and sharing their insights with you. And without further ado, this is Gabriel and I's conversation with Mark Cousins. Um, and to kind of jump into it, I, my first question has got a little bit of a, a backstory. Um, so part of how you describe visual situations and how you analyze visual, uh, just visuals has had such a profound impact on how I started to look at things. And one mm -hmm. moment that really is forever ingrained is like my Ray Charles moment. Maybe if I went blind, I would still see it, but, um, mm -hmm. for, in maybe for good or for bad, but, uh, earlier last year, um, 
my uh, so this needs a little bit of background. Uh, growing up, my grandma, my aunt lived with my grandma, and as a young kid, I didn't get it. I was like, oh, there's grandma, and there's two, two grandmas, grandma one, grandma two. So we called her two, but she's my great aunt, and um, she was um, diagnosed with stage four cancer, and in 2000. 22 we are uh, we're we're sitting at a table around christmas time and we're all gathered just talking doing the normal thing we would do that evening and on one end of the table is my is my aunt too and on the other end is my brother with his brand new newborn and then from diving into your works and thinking visually and like analyzing in these ways i started to like see like the kind of poetics of this image that forever ingrained in my mind. And we're sitting in this circle, and now this is this like circle of life in a way. Here's someone who's seeing this table maybe for the last time, and then here's someone who's seeing the table for the first time. What are they thinking? What does this room look like to them? And like I had this all this fire, all these questions and all these like insights exploding in my mind because of your work. Like because of how you analyze things like that would have never uh, that I, I, that moment would still be special and tragic in the same way, but like it wouldn't have resonated and inspired me as much as it has. So, and that comes from diving into all your all your work. And like my question with that is, when you look visually at an image, like you do like this Bruce Lee tactic of like like here's a philosophical point, here's a scientific point, here's a here's a expressionist point, and like. But um, before the Z axis hits you, like, do you find a lens that typically you're looking through? Are you looking at it as a as a filmmaker? Are you looking at it as a uh, being moved emotionally? Are you looking at it through a scientific lens when you analyze an image? Thank you for your question. Yes, a filmmaker, and yes, uh, I'm also looking as a kind of boy, you know, a kind of child who was growing up, and when I grew up, I was pretty rubbish at words, but I was very good at images, you know, and I think, uh, you know, um, and so I, I realize when I look at something now, I can, I'm pretty good at seeing something in an image or seeing, I think, something in life in general. I'm very influenced by an American writer who I'm sure you know called Temple Grandin, you yeah. know, and, you know, mm -hmm. Oh, and I think Temple writes brilliantly about this stuff. Obviously, she's, well, for people who, many people who are listening to this will know who she is, but she's neurodiverse and, you know, and autistic. And, and she, her last book is called Visual Thinking, and it's utterly brilliant about encouraging you to be good at what you're good at. And I'm a good looker. And a lot of my work is about looking and the visual things, you know, and I'm sort of rubbish at the word side of things and the writing side of things. But, you know, we know you, we all, you, you, got, you guys know, and I know, and Temple Grandin knows that the visual thinking is a brilliant thing in itself. We don't all need to be brilliant at writing essays in school or college. We don't need to be all great at the verbal world, but the visual world is the room next door. It's a magnificent place, and those are, and once you go in there, you're in there for life in a way. I think that's well said. And there's yeah. there's something to an image that strikes you more, like even just like thinking about vi like instructions. When it comes with an image, I can put together that IKEA furniture way better than trying to yeah. read the letters. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. I mean, I could do that easily, you know. And, and as you know, you know, our art schools and our football teams and our engineering colleges are full of people who are great at that side of stuff and not good at the other side. And as you know, again, we have to make sure that, you know, our school systems understand the fact that, you know, if somebody isn't great at writing, nonetheless, they can be gr great at the other stuff, the visual stuff. Um, Dave's story kind of reminded me of this Pasolini quote that I think you quote in another interview, which is cinema is recovery. Um, and this kind of idea, one of my favorite films is The Apple by Samira Makhmabov, and that film just strikes me so wow. much of that, you know, this idea of kind of healing or retribution or something through cinema. And um, I don't know if you could just like kind of elaborate on that idea of cinema's recovery okay. well i think i slightly love you for even saying that you know <laughs> and so pasolini you know cinema is recovery what he what he meant by that is you know that 
And Pierre Paolo Pasolini, uh, for people who are listening, you know, is this great uh, Italian poet and polemicist and also filmmaker. And what he meant is that when you make an image, you get better. And it's a weird thing to say, you know, but to make uh, a, make something visual is to externalize or get rid of some hardship or pain. And I think that, you know, I think it's he again, it's that's that that's those of us who are good at imagery. But it's a really lovely thing to say, you know, cinema is recovery. And in terms of the Apple, Samira Macmath's film, The Apple, uh, the, the, as, as you know, because you like it, it's about two girls who were imprisoned by their father in Iran. But what the genius of this film is that she didn't judge the father. She didn't preach. She didn't tell us what to think. She thought, you know, this man was keeping his children indoors because he was trying to do something good. He was trying to protect them from the world, from globalization. Now, he was wrong, but she had such a generous imagination that uh, she didn't want to... Um, challenge him on that but what she did as you know is she got these girls to play themselves and to you know to recreate the story but in a an imaginative realm and a kind of almost mythic realm and i think a lot of art and music and poetry is about taking a sad experience or a troubling experience and recovering from it by repurposing it, by making a shape out of it. And that's what Samira Makhmalbaf does in that film. Yeah, I think I, I wrote an essay about that film and I read that um, the the experiences that they're having in, in the film are some of the first experiences they've had with the outside world. Yes, yeah. that first moment where the girls come out into the world, they come out of the world. But again, it's important to say there'd be, you know, to two girls have a bad time and then you ask them to recreate the bad time. Mm -hmm. There was ethical, moral problems about that. Samira Makhmalbaf um, avoided all those problems. And that's really interesting, I think. It's, in, it's, it's also really interesting just to, to not try to impose kind of like a narrative or like how you're saying ill painting of the father who is trying to do something good and, in turn was doing something bad, but just to hear and see and not just to experience what it is in a way without casting something on it. And the, I think there's something, maybe uh, maybe there's a greater picture in like some of Iranian culture that also displays that type of uh, thinking and listening and openness. Or like, have you, have you noticed that through other films? Because musically, um, there's like a like the idea of microtonalism and the idea of lack of form in a way, which is the form makes that listening and that being within the moment and not trying to project where it's going a really, a really unique and beautiful culture. Yeah, that's very interesting. You've mentioned a number of complicated things in there. So that's Respond to them, you know. So yes, I've spent quite a lot of time in Iran, and of course, the way you know Iran has a broadly fascist government, we hate it, right? You know, but the people of Iran, the culture of Iran, the poetics of Iran is, uh, you know, re uh, yeah, that's all remarkable. Iran doesn't have the tradition of the novel, you know, so there aren't many great Iranian novels, but you know, and like. Everybody, including working class people, not, not totally educated people, are able to talk about poetry, the great poets like Hafez and Saudi and others. And so I think that's affected the culture in, in quite a few ways. And it's really interesting, Dave, that you mentioned microtonal stuff, which is, you know, as you know, the notes between the notes. You know? And, and we're all looking for the notes between the notes, you know, we're looking for kind of something that, you know, in between that we haven't heard before that moves us, that's excited us, that doesn't, that that feels slightly wrong and yet it's right. So that whole kind of microtonal thing um, is uh, very valuable because it, it, when you hear a, a tone between a tone in a piece of music, you, you feel an emotion that you maybe haven't felt before, you know, so it's very exciting. Yeah. 
One thing musically, I was I wanted to ask you was um, I want I want to pull up the the I think the direct quote, but in a letter you wrote to yourself as an eight year old, or eight and a half year old, which is a real beautiful statement and a real beautiful um uh um. Uh, I want to say foundation you guys did. Um, but you said, um, uh, da, da, da. you need cinema in the way you need to dance to remind your bodily and mental liberties that existence affords you, which <laughs> what a heavy sentence, but like did, a, <laughs> and like in that letter itself was so beautiful. And you have this way of being so honest with yourself. That's so inspiring. But like, as far as like dance, when did that like, when did you start to emote in that way? And did that, do you think, help you enjoy or appreciate the uh, emotion in motion that cinema um, allows? <laughs> That's another complicated th question. I don't remember right. I, I remember writing that letter. I don't remember that sentence. But yes, of course, you. we all know, anybody listening to this, and you you guys know that, you know, when I'm, when I'm talking to you now, I'm using my brain, right? Mm -hmm. And I have a brain, yes. and it functions. So I can put sentences together, right? I can hear what you say and try to have a kind of intellectual, emotional response to that, you know, but I'm not only the top half of my body. I'm not only a brain in a jar. I'm a full body thing, you know, and the best bits of being alive are when you stop thinking in some way and just Dance, you know, dancing, I think, is so important. And swimming, I love night swimming in particular, you know. And um, I think those things where if you're lucky enough to have a good functioning brain, which I do, you know, the big pleasure is to switch it off and dance. And, you know, I work a lot with Tilda Swinton. And, and when we do our festivals, we do festivals here in Scotland, but other, you know, we did one in, um, in China as well. And what we would do before any film, we would show a film, but before we show the film, we play very loud music, often turn the lights off completely and dance. And then you get hot and sweaty and it's a kind of mosh pit approach to life, you know, and, and, so, you know, sort of life is the mosh pit in some way. And lots of people are pretending that it's not. And lots of people are pretending that they can think their way through life or control their way through life. But that's not totally true. Um, yeah, connected to that, you uh, in Life May Be, you kind of talk about um, nakedness similarly. Yes. Um, which was really profound. And I, I think in Women Make Film, um, you show the sealed soil. I yes. I think that's what's called the Iranian film. And there's that beautiful scene. I watched it shortly after watching that documentary. And there's that Where scene. she takes her clothes off in the rain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've never seen a film that made me want to take my clothes off. And in that moment, I remember just like this exhilarating feeling of, I have to get naked too, to be right there with her. And like... I, I don't know. Are there films that make you want to get naked and dance? And, you know, yeah, yeah, do you have that kind of response when watching a film? Yeah. Well, for, can I say again, thank you, guys, you know, because, you know, it's it's rare that I talk to people who have who have seen a film like that. You know? So I really totally am grateful for the fact that you know Iranian cinema and you've seen these films so mm, thank you so much yes the answer to, to the naked naked question is in a way you know you you know I, I, I want to see everything naked you know um, you know I think that you, you are I, I you know I was brought up in conservative Ireland you know and you guys are in Cleveland Ohio right and I'm it's probably, you know, there. I suspect that there are a lot of conservative people there in a way, you know, which, you know, and and even I think the left, the liberals are not good about body often. You know, they think that, you know, that uh, leftist culture is about thinking. But I think body is central to everything we do. So I want to watch everything naked. You know, there, there are some films particularly particularly so i think you know a lot of queer cinema is probably better naked you know but i think that almost anything would be <clears throat> better naked and it's funny and um, this issue came up uh, i was asked to go to some conference on body awareness 
uh, like a couple of years ago. And I said, yeah, okay, I'll do it as long. And they asked me to give the keynote speech. And I said, yeah, okay, I'll do it as long as I can do it naked. And they said, oh, let, can we get back to you on that? And then they got back and they said, um, uh, you can do it, but you have to wear your underwear. And I thought, really? Like, <laughs> so it's, you know, it's an ongoing issue, I think, around body. It's almost, it's almost like the idea of someone being that comfortable is uncomforting, which is weird because it, it, it takes such a long, a long time for someone to be okay with who they are in society and let alone it's, it's, it's pretty profound that the comfort with one's body is so like almost alarming in a way, but like, and it's pretty crazy that they wouldn't let you do, do that. That's, it. but it, it kind of, it makes, yeah, I, I, I don't want to say it makes sense because it makes sense why they'd be worried, but it, in the bigger picture, it's really interesting that, that, that openness and, uh, uh understanding of oneself that almost like, instead of reaching enlightenment being enlightened is uh, kind of like uh, intimidating or or seen as like uh I, I don't know where i'm going with that but it's it, it just it strikes me as as wild that someone would have an issue with that especially like at a conference like about it yeah. and there, there there's political dimension to this right. obviously because of you know um body shaming and things like that, you know, so people don't conform to a certain body shape. So that's political dimension to it. But there's something more existential than that. It's just like um, the I it's it's fine to put on clothes, but it's also fine not to put on clothes, you know, and uh, I think that the culture has got quite far to go in this area. You know, it, it's not something we even need to think about, uh, really. Well, it's, it kind of makes me think of a uh, it was a line you had on slow cinema about sensation to contemplation. Like, yeah. But the opposite, the physical sensation, or not the opposite, maybe the complete direct on the head on the nail, the, uh, the, uh, the sensation and then contemplating about it. Yeah. If you take a long view, you know, and we were talking about your, you're asking about dancing and I was talking about mosh pits, all the, all these things are related in some way. I think, you know, that, that sense that, um, we can we can just spend our lives thinking about stuff, analyzing stuff, or you can, you know, you know that word sensorium. You know that sense that your whole, all your senses uh, are part of something. You know, you touch and sound, listening and and tasting, and they're all part of the of you know the, your kind of sensory response to the world. And like every, nearly everybody that I admire in the in in life has who understood that I'm a big a big fan of like a writer like Virginia Woolf or you know like um David Bowie they all understood that you had to throw yourself into an experience without thinking about it too much because if you go in with your brain at the front of something then you're over you're going to overthink it you're not you know, gonna you're not gonna enjoy it. You're not gonna be creative enough. David Bowie was just great at hurling himself in, cutting up, as you know, famously cutting up lyrics, rearranging them in a sort of Dadaist way. You know, so we can learn a lot from that. I was reading this thing today about kind of visualizing cities and uh, or the way cities are visualized, and the writer said something about how um, you know the other senses are kind of null in the city because you're not necessarily touching things. You're not necessarily talking to people. You're just mm -hmm. looking at them. And, uh, mm -hmm. your films strike me as, you know, even in your more like documentary stuff, there's such an importance of, uh, showing cities as this motif, like yeah. in the story of film, you continually show buildings. And, um, it, it, can you talk a little bit about like the connection between, um, like film in cities a, a little bit. And, you know, I also, uh, I'm a big fan of public transit and uh, you, I was admiring in the story of looking that you were <laughs> taking the bus a lot. And I, and I thought there's some shots that were really beautiful. There's one where I think you're on a building or something and you see a, a bus go by and I, I was no, yes, oh, I... buses and trains are so intrinsic to film. Yeah. I mean, cities are visual 
you know, they're like a distillation of the visual world, aren't they? You know, like there's so much happening in your city right now and there's so much happening in my city right now. When I wake up in the morning, if I'm feeling a bit low or sad, I look out the window and I see people going to work being on, you know, the public transport's going by, all sorts of things are happening. So there's a, dis, a visual distillation there. And people, a lot of people have uh, have said that, you know, um, things are, uh, the visual world is so intense now, there's so much more to see. It's over, we all feel overwhelmed in some way. And that's sort of true in a way, except that it was always, you know, since cities came along, like in Babylon and the cities, you know, in ancient Greece, you know, there's always been a kind of visual cacophony. And some people hate that. And I love it. And I can't get enough of that overload that feeling of I want more visual intensity and of course the French you know I'm sure you know that you know the French when in the late 1800s Baudelaire and all these people and Walter Benjamin all these people are talking about wow look there's so much to see bring it on even more to see you know I mean we're we're to be overwhelmed like to be a kind of to have a kind of Niagara Falls of visual information is not bad. Yeah, in the U.S., there are so many of these awful kind of cookie-cutter suburbs, and sometimes I'll take a camera somewhere like that and try to film, and it's like nothing is photogenic. You know, you have to get really close to something, but in a city you can use the wide lens, and it's just everything is immediately... You, you, you don't even have to think about where to put the camera, you know, you can put it anywhere. It's just, a city like, you know... Well, New York City or Philadelphia, you know, some of these cities are the best things that have ever been imagined. Yeah. I, I would put Tehran and Calcutta and India, you know, the cities are just, they are such dense visual experiences, how not to enjoy them, you know. So I, yeah, I've made five city films. In a different kind of direction, um, they... I read one quote and like this kind of like, I guess it's going from the external idea of looking at a city to the internal of looking at the mind. You, uh, you said Orson Welles is neurochemistry mm-hmm. and like you all, and also in the same quote, uh, not the same quote, but I think around the same paragraph I read, um, you mentioned that you sing, uh, the piano theme to touch of evil to calm yourself. Was, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm sorry, Henry Mancini. Yeah. So, with the idea of it, what what is neurochemical? Like, can you elaborate on that? In Orson Welles. Yes. Uh, so, what I think is that I never met Orson Welles, obviously, you know, but I um, I made a film about Orson Welles, as you know, and I think that he was absolutely brilliant in working out what was happening. In his brain, in his mind, I, he, his spatial imagination, you know, also his political imagination, but mostly his spatial imagination, and then turning that into cinema, making the camera do what he could see inside his head. You know, and, and I'm sure you know this, but in, in neuroscience now, there's this idea of hypophantasia, which means, you know, that people can super see something before they make it. And I think I'm slightly in that um, part of the visual spectrum as well. What that means, in other words, is that can you, if you're a filmmaker or a painter or doing anything visual, can you see it before you make it? And Orson Welles was definitely somebody like that. So if you think of the opening of his famous film, Touch of Evil, for example, there, you know, this famous tracking shot, which it's got the Henry Mancini music and it snakes through um, Venice, uh, California. He saw that in advance. And I think that's what I mean, you know, like uh, the, the, there are certain people who have got engineering type brains. They can see things before before they make them. Um, I remember once you were talking about um, the filmmaker is God versus uh, God is the filmmaker. And yes, you know, yes. That, yeah, yeah. That's such like a, like that Wellesian kind of idea of he envisioned it um, 
beforehand is such a the filmmaker is God. Um, refresh me on what this term was called, the uh, hyper... Hi, hypophantasia. Yeah. Hypophantasia. Um, do you think, is there maybe like a kind of a disconnect between filmmakers who kind of don't visualize it ahead of time or they like um like a documentarian maybe doesn't quite have that uh mindset of the seeing something yeah that, that sounds as if of what it's what i'm saying but i don't think it is because you know lots of documentary filmmakers you know we think of a documentary filmmaker as somebody who takes her camera and she goes out in the world and she films stuff and then sees what happens you know but i think lots of of documentary filmmakers actually can see the film in advance in some way um so what i was meaning when i was talking about the filmmaker as god but or there's god as a filmmaker is that there are um certain you know, lots of filmmakers feel that they've got something inside them. They've got a world inside them that they need to share with us to externalize it, you know, to expose it. And that's broadly called self-expression, you know, and every and so many art schools and film school teach self-expression. And they have to say, you have got you've got something in you and you need to share it with the rest of us. That's the kind of the filmmaker is God point of view, you know. And then if you believe that, then you go out on the set and there are five, there, there are 50 people and you're telling them exactly what to do and shaping everything. Mm -hmm. But I also, I'm closer to the opposite of that, you know, which is there's nothing inside me, you know. Um, I think that filmmaking isn't, for me at least, self-expression. I think that certainly I'm not very interesting on the inside. And so what I want to do is look out into the world and see what's out there and notice the magnificent valley of tears and the mountain top which is out there and try to capture that in some way and i think a lot of a lot of artists are also really interested in that you know um, and i think i know that i quote often uh, the the american writer gertrude stein and you know she lived in paris for a long time and she said that she said, Imag um, imagination is obs observation plus construction. Mm. And so what she meant by that is you look out, what is out there? What is brilliant beyond your imagination? You know, what is magnificent? Bring it in, shape it, construct it. And there you've got your novel. There you've got your film. There you've got your painting. So I would, you know, it's a very interesting question. And, I'm, you know, I love the films of Scorsese and I love the films of these great filmmakers who have in some way inner worlds. No, actually, no, no, I would say David Lynch, you know, has an inner world that he wants to bring out. But I'm more submissive than that. You know, it's almost like a sort of, dominant submissive thing and i'm definitely submissive in that way i want to see something uh and then shape it hey, that's super inspiring because like there's kind of like going through uh a, a music school it's interesting and like i've talked with a, a couple other musicians about this idea you go through this the school and they teach you all the technique they teach you the form they teach you the structure but when it comes down to okay express yourself there's no like guidelines on that right and like i think that's beautiful in a way because it leaves that place for you art uh, yeah i think art is art is not about self-expression in my opinion you know i mean that's obviously going against the grain of nearly everything we're taught but it's not about self-expression in my yeah. view it's a yeah the best way to make something is to get on a public bus somewhere you know, like the great, the great um, Sergei Eisenstein, who I've got on my arm here, you know, he, when he got to a new city, this, you know, this great Russian Soviet filmmaker, he, when he got to a new city, he would get on a bus and take it to the end of the line, to the terminus, you know, where in the public projects and the, you know, what we would call the housing estates, you get off there. And then he would say, that's where cinema is, you know, and that's about looking, that's about just going out to discover is that kind of like within the concept of his ecstasy yes like good guys are so impressive i have to say i'm really 
I'm so it's brilliant to talk to people who, who are so knowledgeable and insightful. Um, yeah, that ecstasis, that idea of, you know, he, his idea was you need to get out of yourself. Yourself isn't all that interesting. No, no. So get out of yourself. And, ex, and, and ecstasis literally means getting out of stasis, getting out of you know, a standpoint, get moving, you know. And I think that, you know, for me, that's oh, been totally inspiring. Firing. And I, you know, uh, all the time, for a very long time now, I've just wanted to discover new things. You know, I yeah, always something for me, all my work is about discovering something new, hopefully. Do you like with this, like urge and need to discover new things like how do you do you how do you go about that for yourself do you just put yourself in situations you've never been like yeah yeah (laughs) you know i bring my camera everywhere i shoot every day i bring my camera every day and you want to put yourself in situations you've never been you know i'm lucky enough i'm very 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 lucky to be uh, invited lots of places but i go I, i say yes to a place if i haven't been before when I, when I was director of Edinburgh Film Festival in my 20s, uh, though, you know, there was a terrible siege in, in Sarajevo and in, and 10,000 people were killed in that siege. And I got a message from a bunch of people there who wanted to do an underground cinema. Mm. And they said, would you come to Sarajevo? And the, you know, the war was on. I said, yeah, of course. And that was me just trying to see something. I wanted to see something, you know, um, see a place, see people who were living in extremis. And I went. And they, it turns out they, were, they invited loads and loads of directors of film festivals and I was the only one who said yes <laughs> and I was glad I went I was glad I went because I learned loads of stuff there I learned that even in war you need stories you need cinema you know you don't only you know you don't only need bread you need roses hmm. Hmm. that's beautiful that's such a beautiful that's a beautiful statement but it's true, isn't it? Yeah, no, it's, yeah. It's, like, oh, you know, and I'm working with a, a, a filmmaker from Ukraine at the moment, and I met her in Ukraine, and we, you know, it's true. You know, it's, of course, we need physical subst- sustenance, but you also need inspiration. You need imagination. You need myth and fable and all that sort of stuff. You know, you need a full encounter with the world. Not only a part. The thing about war, and I grew up in a war zone, right in Belfast in Northern Ireland. War narrows your horizons so much, and it mm. it it limits how you can live. You know, so that's why it's important to expand the horizons of how you can live. Um, going on this idea of kind of trying new things or, or putting yourself into a situation you've never been in. Um, you talk a bit in. Uh, um, what is this film called love about taking ecstasy and i'm curious about how um psychedelics psychedelic drugs if at all have like kind of influenced your visual thinking or have kind of changed the way you've seen things yeah that's a good question and so i haven't you know I've, i've done heroin once and i've done mushrooms twice so i haven't had many you know hallucinogen experiences psycho 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 uh psycho experiences but uh they changed my life uh they, um, I was already quite a sort of visually engaged person, but the first time I took uh, LSD, yeah, first time I took acid, um, it made me a better filmmaker, I think. Uh, it just sort of loosened all that stuff. It shook off a lot of, you know, shake it off, shake it off, you know. You know, it it shook off a lot of inhibitions about what a visual thing is and how it connects to other stuff. And all. so that was a big moment for me. You know, and the mushroom experience was um, uh, more slightly more complicated because when I took mushrooms, the first thing I saw was Diana Ross singing. And the way she was singing was it was a series of um, diamonds in the sky just coming at me. <laughs> so, like everybody is boring on their and their hallucinogenic experience, but definitely it changed my life for the better. So you could almost, I oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. So you could almost see music then. 
No, you can see definitely, you definitely see music. Yeah. I think that's when music becomes visual. And as you guys, you know, like um, we in the film world aspire to music. You know, we want to, we want our films to be musical and music people aspire to cinema. A lot of music people really want to make their films cinematic, you know, so we're, we're reaching out to each other. I think in these, you know, these two mediums are reaching out to each other, but uh, my few experiences on hallucinogens really emphasize that there's no difference. And we know that, you know, the more you look at synesthesia, for example, you know, there's a sort of no difference between the visual world and the musical world, even though it feels so. Yeah. The kind of like the build on that like idea of where music and cinema like long to touch or like just almost barely are like connecting. Like there's there's a lot of like and I'm, this would be more like if like a structural kind of like. Uh, look at some of these things like there's a lot of elements that are used to describe the same techniques and approaches in each medium right Mm -hmm. so like Mm -hmm. with uh, music I find myself using a lot of dynamic and in the sense of music that's when it gets extremely loud then brings it down to a whisper making it the silent making silence the loudest dynamic but like when I try to think of that in like a, a cinema or in film like do you like like what's the kind of what's the area that they're close longing to touch in that way, as well, far as like exact- dynamics? I think it's exactly the same. It's about amplitude. You know, are you at the top of the wave or at your bottom? You know, and so I think in cinema we know things like simple things like you can speed it up or slow it down. But in cinema, it's more complicated. It's in the number It's also about quietude, and you make moments of almost you know, minimalism where almost nothing is happening and then suddenly you cut to a huge thing, you know, and that's exactly the same as the idea of dynamics and music, I think, you know, and my new, this, this new film, one of the, one of the films I've done about fascism and, and the, and the rise of Mussolini, et cetera, you know, there, there are moments where we almost get to zero. There's one point where, you know, I show a shot of Adolf Hitler and it's, there's no sound at all, like zero. And then suddenly we cut to loads of sound, you know, and you want to, you want to stop the world and then suddenly start it like a roller coaster. That's beautiful. Like I noticed that with that film, just even the the titles of the chapters, like Lissando, like they're 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 reminiscing in music. Yeah, and like, yeah, yeah. Lissando, you know the slow. Well, you know what Lissando means. You have the slow slide, yeah. and that Lissando's in the name of the last chapter in that film, and and so there. I was trying to say, you know, fascism, there's something, there's something that happened a hundred years ago in Italy and then, you know, in Germany and elsewhere in Spain, but maybe it's also happening now. And so the, the idea, I use that word glissando to sort of, as it were, we're, as suggested, we're sliding back in a way. Um, kind of to touch on one, one filmmaker I love, like Simon Liang does that a lot where he <laughs> kind of like bur- a burst of sound after these like very slow movements and you know i i hate or i'm not like a huge fan of like lists or anything but like the sight and sound list i wanted to talk to you about like the newest uh top poll because i was so happy to see um chantal ackerman's film at number one and you know i, I go to film school and it it would be like damn near impossible to get you know one of my classmates to watch a three and a half hour uh slow film um and so what do you think this kind of means about film culture at the moment? Because um, I was just sh- in shock to see that personally. First of all, can I just say, don't despair if your classmates don't want to see that stuff. Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> there are loads of us around the world. They might, they might not be in your class, but there are loads of us around the world. And, and we yeah. have strength. Numbers, right. So we. <laughs> On terms of it, it's really interesting about Jean Dielman and Chantal Ackerman, you know, like somebody told me, I didn't realize it, but realize this, but 20 years ago in the Sight and Sound poll, 20 years ago, four people v- voted for Jean Dielman. 
and I was one of them, and I think I was the only guy, you know. So I was sort of slightly thinking, oh, well, you know, if you push and push and push enough. 20 years ago when I voted for Jan Dillman, if somebody had said to me, it'll be voted number one, I would have said no. Are we allowed to swear on this podcast? Go for it. Swear? Go for it. <laughs> oh, fuck. Hey, you know. Uh, and now look what happens, you know, and and there's much more to go. It's absolutely great that this film has been, you know, voted the top film. And that means that a lot of people will seek it out thinking, what have I missed? And that's really good, you know. But the canon always needs to be exploded, you know, and, all, and so you get, you get a list and then you improve it and you improve it. So... You mentioned Simon Yang, for example. You know, his some of his films should be much closer to the top of the conversation for those of us who love cinema. But it's you know, it's it's encouraging that a Chantal Ackerman film is at the top, you know, and it, like when I was director of Edinburgh Film Festival a quarter of a century ago, uh, I put one of her films on the closing night, and then we had a party afterwards, and I was Hillary people hated it and, you know, just saying, why did you do that? Why did you do that? So, you know, there's always going to be a fight, but we, we, we will, we can win this fight and we are winning in some ways this fight. Which film of hers did you show? It was called An da- Divan in New York, a, div- a, a couch in New York. Oh, yeah. I love that one. It's, I love it. I love it. And it was, I, it was terrible. I would, I had a terrible night that night, but I was, I was right. Did yeah. you do that? You know, you know, I don't, I, it makes it sound as if I'm always ahead of the curve. I'm not always ahead of the curve. I'm sometimes behind the curve, but you know, in the case of Chantal Ackerman, now it's accepted that she's really one of the greats. Do you think, Kind of like well, the idea of like slow cinema and like um, in a way with the world kind of stopping in 2020, having this and like this kind of maybe oversaturation of like films that are very action based. It has something to do with maybe some inaction in that sense, some like longing to like take a scene and take it in before like knowing exactly where it's going to go, like the slowing down of just being in the moment. Do you think some of that may have inspired um, this appreciate like this kind of uh, this appreciation for that maybe where it wasn't before. Yeah, that's possible. Obviously, you know, it's action cinema has been on the rise for a long time, and slow cinema has been on the rise for a long time. But then, as you say, COVID came along and the pandemic came along, and I think that certainly it was the case that we were all locked down and we're in our own rooms, we're in our own heads. And so we had a bit more time to think and about stuff, you know, and a lot of people just went back to the classics and watched some like it hot and, you know, whatever. And that's great. Of course, you know, cinema was, it's important to remember that cinema was, got us through the pandemic pandemic and not only movie fans, you know, not only movie buffs, but more generally, a lot of people watch cinema, but I do think that, um, the feeling of quietude and stillness and aloneness was something that people felt more during the COVID era than previously. And that might have had an impact. But I think far more is the impact of the Me Too movement and stuff like that. And people actually went looking for films directed by women. Now, I've never in any way categorized like a film like Jean Dielman is a film directed by a woman. I've just said it's great cinema, you know, mm-hmm. but I think people did go looking for something looking. They thought, okay, I, because of me too, they thought I need to inform myself. Mm-hmm. And in, as a result of realizing that maybe taxi driver and raging bull and the Godfather and apocalypse now, maybe they're not the best films ever made, people went elsewhere and they discovered other things. And that's pretty good. You know, there's a lot more discovery to do, but that's pretty good. Yeah, I wanted to kind of talk about the pandemic a little because... um, but I, can, Could I go and get myself a gin and tonic? Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Totally. yeah. It's, just, it's just, it'll be like 30 seconds. Is that yeah. all right? Yeah. <laughs> I 
don't have any tonic, so it's going to be a gin and coke. <laughs> that sounds like you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, I'm back. Cheers. <laughs> cheers, cheers, cheers. Cheers. Um, I'm enjoying this. Yeah, us too. Thank you. We, I've been very much looking forward to this, my yeah. friend. This is, means a lot. Thank you so much. And it means even more that you enjoy it. <laughs> like, yeah, I feel that, you know, yeah, it's, it's not often I talk to kindred spirits, but we're on the same page, I think. Yeah, thank you. Um, over the pandemic, uh, you know, I, I started... Um, feeling like I needed to come out as non-binary and trans and mm -hmm. you know it, I think like the isolation um kind of made me realize that this needs to come out and like one of the ways of kind of repressing it was watching a lot of films I was watching like three films a day during the pandemic and like um and I I started to have this like realization that like you know there there can be this dark side of cinephilia of like um you know, am, am I running from something by continually going to this other world, even though it is very beautiful? And, um, I don't, do you, do you ever feel that way? Like, um, that maybe sometimes you're running from something when you have like periods of, I'm going to watch <clears throat> tons of films or, or is it always blissful? Well, what an amazing question. Um, so, yeah, you're running for, away from something and towards something as well, you know. And so um, I find that the solutions are in cinema uh, as well as the problems. You know, cinema is morally neutral. I, you know, I've long, long been against the, I never use the phrase the male gaze or the female gaze. I always talk about the androgynous gaze. Uh, cinema is, you know, a place where you can, sort of find anything and everything. You can find affirmation there, but you can also find the opposite. You know, you, as you suggest, you can just um, find um, cinema can be a place that doesn't challenge you at all. It just confirms your biases about yourself or other people. And so that's... You know, it's not a place of liberation, I would say. Okay. I yeah. think. So did you did you know that you were non-binary before the yeah, pandemic? Yeah, I did. Oh, yeah. And, and yeah, I was very comfortable, you know, not coming out, which is interesting. And then as soon as the pandemic happened, I was like, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. I need to come out. Um, yeah. And I, I, I think so. Uh, sorry, sorry, go on. Oh, I was just saying, and I kind of, wrote a film and um during that time and decided to kind of come out through a film um which really helped and then you know once there were vaccines and these things were lifted i started coming out to people so i think i mean i think cinema overall is you know as i mentioned earlier i work with tilda swinton a lot and that you know that project i did women make film you know and, and so i worked with tilda and i worked with jane fonda and adjo ando and Deborah Winger and a bunch of brilliant people, you know, what we all had in common was the determination to not gender cinema. All these women said, yeah, we want to be part of this because you're not trying to say anything about women and that cinema is, you know, but they loved the fact that I wasn't trying to say anything about the female gaze or the main male gaze, you know. And when we're sitting in the dark in the cinema, at its best, you're no one. Mm -hmm. you, you sort of dial yourself down to almost zero and therefore you maximize your ability to um, empathize, obviously. But that's a different point to the one that you're making, you know. But for me, I've always wanted cinema to neutralize me. You know what I was talking earlier about submission, and you know there was a you know there's always a slightly almost sexual feeling about that. You know, do something to me. A filmmaker needs to do something to me. You know, so that's I've been always looking for some cinema to force itself on me in a way. You know, which is very different to what you're saying. You're looking to express something you know or, and when i go to the movies i want to express nothing in a way mm. does that make sense yeah and you know that's 
it reminds me of, I had a film professor who once said um, Plato was kind of envisioning a proto cinema with the cave allegory. Mm. And that sounds a lot like what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, that's often said. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think, yeah, in a way, it's more exciting than that. <laughs> yeah, definitely, yeah, definitely. But, <laughs> but that's, that's the kind of yin and yang, the beautiful, both parts are coming together here. Someone's showing, even if like there's a film that isn't made with an intent, if it's a data, it's, there's something, something behind it, right? There's someone doing something and then you are letting it do something to you. It completes the yeah. circle. And that's like, uh, I, I like with a film that I can't comprehend or I don't know what happened or where it's going. And like, mm -hmm. That's and when I walk away thinking more about what I just saw than understanding more, that's mm -hmm. that's such an impactful, inspiring moment. That kind of goes back to what you're talking with, uh, being just looking for the new, being in all, and being like uplifted mm -hmm. by this non knowing and not not having like a thing to say, but taking in the beauty of the mountains. In like, there's something so like impactful about that, and when cinema can do that, and like, but also at the same spin of the wheel someone's spinning it trying to say it's a beautiful like just listening to both uh, how you guys are uh how you're expressing coming through with this and how you're expressing letting it come through you it's just a, a, it's a really insightful like moment <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, you, you, you want to get lost in the forest don't yeah. you you want to you know you want somebody to take you by the hand and then let your hand go and you feel scared and you're lost and then just when you then they take your hand again i i i like that feeling i think that, you know lots of people if are if they're honest with themselves are only slightly half awake and they're sort of a lot of people feel that they're sort of wish there was more the you know slightly sleepwalking you know and cinema can provide that more you know it, and yeah and so can the mosh pit <laughs> Well, a lot of, I feel like uh, in just seeing people around me and seeing kids and seeing where, uh, being around a lot of people that have this immense talent and urge to do something, but not knowing what that is and being afraid <laughs> if they yes. know what that is, they can't do that. And like the beauty of someone sh leading by example and doing a thing is such like an impactful, prominent thing in one's life that if someone like if you can make a film about Orson Welles and and or, or writing to him, you know what I mean? Like I, I I could think like I'm communicating with him as well, and like you know what I mean? Like this whole like we lead by example in a way, even if we don't know where we're going. And I think just someone doing a thing is 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 guiding that hand, but not holding it, you know? And like that's like I, I don't know if that. Uh, it, it, it seems yeah, I, think so. and I, I think that's right and i think that you know cinema attracts nervous people shy people you know people who come alive in the dark and so that's where that means that like i did a talk uh last night in a college here you know and so a lot of people are asking questions a lot and they were oh great and then but you look out and you see the people who aren't asking any questions because they're too shy mm. you know and the relationship between shyness and cinemas movies is very interesting for me as well, you know, because the shy people come alive in the dark, you know, and loads of us who are shy or, you know, on fixed and on moored in some way, you know, I think that it's the place, it's, it's, it's our world, it's our realm, it's our harbour, it's our place to sail from, it's our place to sail back to, you know, <laughs> all those metaphors. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Or, or even just like the the kid that wants to sing but is in a punk rock band screaming, and when you talk to them yeah. after the show, like yeah, thank you, you know what I mean? Like, where did that yeah. come from? The the and there's something to someone who is shy and is hearing everything, like you know, there's yeah. they they're taking in more, and that that's that inspiration, that's that mountain that yeah. maybe someone who's talking doesn't see yeah. or doesn't hear. Yeah. And it's important to make sure that they feel okay and realize that shyness is not a handicap, right. you know, and, you know, it's really not. It's sort of privilege in a way, you know, I think, and, and other kinds of diversity, you know, these things where you feel as, a, you know, I don't know, he, you, in America, I, I know it's the case, and here it's also the case that it's assumed that if you're in the film industry, you need to network and sell yourself and go mm -hmm. into a room 
But what if you're not that person? And most of us are not that person, you know. And the person who is um, super shy or um, not, who doesn't have a fixed identity of some sort, they are the ones who often make the great cinema. Um, going off... This, this idea, one of my favorite quotes that you've quoted a lot is the Brisson, um, uh, make visible what without you might perhaps never have been seen. Um, and I had like this mind blowing moment watching um, Ho Shao Shen, the daughter of the Nile film. There's that, uh, there's a moment where there's a character that uh, gets a waterproof watch as a present overseas. And um, his friends are like, how do you know if it's waterproof? And then a few scenes later, He's writing a letter and you see the watch and a glass of water. And it's so striking to me. And like, I, I was like, oh, that's the Brisson thing. You know, it's, it can be, it can be this, because I think when you talk about it, sometimes it's like this very big, vast, you know, women make film, like let's show the women filmmakers. And then I was like, oh, how do I do that? You know, how do I make something that big that, you know, without me might not have been seen. And then I saw the Ho Shao Shen thing. I was like, oh, it can be this, quiet thing of a, a watch and a glass of water um that's, i mean that's totally true you know yeah. i mean it's you know it, it's often the small mo the small thing the small moment i mean in this conversation we have said well i've said a few things i've never said before for example you know so you always want to get into new territory whatever it is you know so it doesn't need to be a grand gesture in any way yeah I, yeah, I don't know if my thing was a question at all, but I, I just love that Brisson <laughs> quote. And I, I wanted to hear you talk about it more. So thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's, a, it's the crucial thing, isn't it? You know, yeah. I think for me, all the time, I'm thinking, has this been seen before? You know, if it has, why do I need to do it? You know, there's other stuff to say. There's always other stuff to say, you know, and if you force yourself to think what you as a person or what I as a person have not said, there will be stuff, and either we didn't say it because we were too shy, or we just didn't realize we hadn't said it, which is more often the case. Yeah. And then you think, right, let's say it. It's almost. Um, are you familiar with Victor Wooten? He's a bassist. No. Okay, he's a bassist from uh, Nashville and played in a with Bella Fleck and the Fleck Tones, who did a mm -hmm. very interesting uh, music documentary on uh, the music of Africa. And it's called Throw Your Heart Down, but um, where he goes as a banjo player and takes the banjo back where it came from, right? And like, uh, it's, it's, uh, I think I've heard of this. Yeah, yeah, I think I've heard of this one. Yeah. It's very, very moving. It's very moving to see someone from a different, like, musical uh, vocabulary fit in and be able to play. And, but anyway, so Victor has this, um, this whole concept of music. And I'm, I'm not just him, everyone does, but he presents it as more of a conversation. And the idea of you don't think about what you're going to say before you say it. You just say it when the moment happens. Mm -hmm. So in like, in like with music that there's a, in, with film and with documentary, and I'm sure like there's this idea of what we're going to talk about. And like, but it doesn't necessarily mean everything's written and, or the reaction's going to happen. So that I, kind of that idea of just like not not even knowing what you're going to say, but you say something that profoundly like resonates in your head later. You're like that that was something I've never thought before or felt before, which would have never happened without that interaction. Yeah, that's true. I mean, we've all been in that place. Anybody who makes stuff, you know, we've been in that place where we think it's going to go one way and it goes another way, and you really think, "Oh God, I'm flying without wings here." You know, it's and um, when you get in, you know, sort of sports people call it the zone, but the educational people, what do they call it? Flow. You know yeah. that? Have you heard of that? Yeah, the flow. You know, all, but both those things. I, I, you know, that the exhilarating thing where um, you planned it one way, it doesn't go that way, and suddenly you have to just, you know, do jazz improvisation or whatever. And it's magnificent, you know, those of us who will have, you know, if you've experienced that, it's unforgettable. It's addictive. You want it again and again, you know, it's, it's better than anything in a way, you know, because you can see a form shaping live. Wow. I mean, it is unforgettable, isn't it? Yeah. 
It's well, that's just like you said. It's so addicting because like it's this thing that didn't exist, and you're you're finding it. It's no longer you're you're being guided with your hand, but now you're forming your own trail, and like the see where that leads and see what uh, if it leads to the forest or to the tree is a very like empowering out empowering thing. And the fact that it can just happen, and the and the fact that you had all the tools all along, you just didn't you weren't in the moment, and like. Or, or weren't or exposed to that moment. Like it's really, yeah. it's really, it really, it's, it's interesting. The, the yin and yang of the practice in the, the dedication to a craft. And then when it comes mm-hmm. to doing it, the letting go and just the flow of it. Like there's this film, uh, Oh gosh, I can't remember the name. It's a documentary on Rave Shankar. Um, mm-hmm, the guitar mm-hmm. player. Have you seen it? I can't remember the name. Yes. I've well, seen I saw one that his daughter made recently, and then I've seen two recently about Shankar. Was it one of those, or was it one, before the? Long I think ago? it was seventies. It was in the. It was an old. No, but I've seen all. Yeah, okay. so um, it, that was my thing. So I've seen all those seventies Ravi Ravi films. Yeah, yeah. Oh, those are so yeah. good, and like uh, there, I found it on YouTube of all places, which is a it's a magic. Uh, but anyway, there's a scene in there where he's talking about his teacher, and his teacher would practice and practice and practice, and he would tie his hair up to the top of the sitar. So if he fell asleep, he would pull himself <laughs> awake and keep going. And then when it got time to the performance, he didn't play at all what he practiced, but he played it all, and like. It's just such an interesting dynamic and beautiful thing that people do, or maybe just expression is, and like, or mm. art is, is this discipline to freedom. And it, well, it's a vocation, you know. You sort of can't stop yourself. It's what, you know, <laughs> and it's what Rilke, you know, Rilke's write letters from a young poet. You know, it's that thing that he he says, you know, if you feel you don't do this, will you die? And that's obviously melodramatic but you sort of feel you have to do that thing you have to make stuff you know if it's music or film if you i certainly for me i feel i just have to i'm an addict i need to i need to not only make but make make it in the most naked way like the most on industrial way possible like in the oh, unplugged is the word in the in the music industry but but for me, it's completely compulsive. Um, Dave just brought up YouTube, and uh, one thing I was really struck by in uh, the story of looking, uh, you talk about the selfie thing and um, how kind of looking down on selfies is kind of this um, almost classist, classist yes. bias. Um, yeah. and one thing that, y- you know, you're, you're in bed, like talking directly to the camera, and it um, gave me this appreciation for YouTubers of all things. Like, it, it felt very, and, and like, I do not mean this like insultingly at all, but it felt very much like that. And I don't know if you, if you kind of felt that way when you were editing it, like, um, <clears throat> that, you know, it was such like a beautiful form or beautiful interpretation of um, that kind yeah. of thing. I think, you know, if the, earth, if the pioneers in cinema, had been able to put a camera on themselves in bed, if the Lumiere brothers or Millies or those early filmmakers, they would have done it, you know, because we've removed the process completely now, almost completely, you know. That, uh, yeah, I, so the reduction of the lighting, the camera and everything to all, to zero is brilliant, you know, and I didn't, in the story of looking, I didn't use it brilliantly, but I used it in some way, you know, and I, I was, and for me, that's updating my sense of what I can do. How minimal can my filmmaking process be? And because I have been very influenced by the Iranian filmmakers like Abbas Kiarostami and others, you know, I'm always trying to work out how, how little, how, the, like the the, the the well, the the light that I used was the you know a, a light that you use to read a book. That was the the I was, yeah. um, and so it was totally liberating liberating for me. So a film like that is part of my process of shedding the industry, mm. getting less and less of the industry into the work. And I feel therefore I'm only beginning in some way on that process and can go further and further. Uh, yeah, I know you spent some time with Kurostami and, you know, he has that beautiful film 10 where he has those small cameras in the car and um, getting into your work, I was, I noticed that instantly that there's that similar 
um, kind of thing. I think maybe he did it for a slightly different reason to kind of get more naturalistic um, performances, you know, without the kind of like um, giant ominous camera on an actor. <laughs> but, uh, you know, when you've interviewed him, right, was that something you kind of like picked up from him or... <laughs> Um, I haven't really, I haven't really interviewed him, but I knew him, and I made a film with him, and you know, I was on my own process, you know, my own journey there for that, because what I hated when I I started directing really young, you know, and in, in my early twenties, and it was all guys, you know, and you needed to do a simple shot, you needed at least five guys, you know, and sparks and all the, you know, the whole technology. And I hated that. I never felt particularly comfortable in a big room of men. So I thought, no, I don't want to do that. So when the cameras miniaturized, I was slightly ahead, you know, so um, I, I was waiting for the miniaturization. Uh, so, uh, but then when I went to Iran and saw how, Abbas worked and, you know, and of course, you know, lots of others, um, Jafar Panahi and others, you know, um, then I quickly updated my own sense of what I could do, you know, and it gives you courage to think they, you know, they'll just film in a car, you know, and that the film that you mentioned, Tan, you know, we have to co-credit it with Mania Akbari, you know, and she, I think she really deserves co-credit in that film. But yeah, what, look, tiny cameras, no lighting, almost zero technology, and yet... It's great. It's what Abbas used to say, you know, or the Iranians in general used to say, you want to make films that are poor on the outside, but rich, poor on the inside, but rich on the outside. Voila, that's it. Yeah. That's what I try to do, you know. Minimal resources, but sort of maximum aesthetics in some way. Sorry. Oh, no worries. Um, I'm back. It's funny, like, uh, my band, like, we're, we we come from music, but our drummer is also, he wanted to be here with us as well. <laughs> like, but um, uh, he's been texting me some questions, <laughs> too. Okay, go for it. But um, to build off that last point, with uh, um, this film called Love, no, no, not this, uh, Life May Be. Um, God, I was blanking where I was going to go off that. Uh, 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 brain work. Life might be the Mania Apri film. Yeah, yeah. Um, is that amazing? When she paints, when she writes the Victoria Wolf yeah. on her body, is that okay. amazing? Oh yeah. It's so, so like th these list of films. Like I've, I've like the story of looking. I left so moved, right? And it just kept like, of like every night I'd watch another one. I'm like, I don't know how the th like. It's so profound. But that okay. That that's where I wanted to go with it. Like. Um, the idea of like so comparing that to music, like if we listen to like a an a John Coltrane record or a Robert yeah. Johnson record, it's just a microphone yeah. in a room, and like there's no like real big expensive mm. production, but mm. that's those that music still resonates now and is still impactful, and like yeah. in building off what you said, and like same with the uh, same with that. Uh, uh, um, uh, life may be like it's just it's a communication between you two it's letters and like and at one point I, I remember we watched it together and I was like it feels like I'm in the middle of something I shouldn't be in the middle of like it was so naked in a way before it was even naked but like like in yeah. that's such a pure and like beautiful feeling but like it's so like accessible in the way of like the richness of it and like I think that idea, I think you were bringing forth that idea of how impactful if something can be made without having to be like shot like a, like a uh, not to put down Marvel movies, but like a Marvel movie where there's CGI, you know what I mean? Like something or yeah. a, a better example is right after I saw that, me and my girlfriend went and saw Women Talking. Have you seen that film? I've not seen it yet. Okay. Yeah. Very, I can't wait. It's 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 so good and it's it's very inspiring and very moving. But like the night before I watched Life May Be and like there was something that struck me so much more honest with Life May Be than women talking. And that's not just to to to, to um, appease you, but it's just like 
There was it, it was the part that wasn't Hollywood. It was the part that was just being into people's conversation and seeing that movement and that inspiration. Yeah, well, you know what? It's thank you. And uh, like maybe it just was exactly as you saw it. You know, I'd been a fan of Manny Apri's work, and so I wrote an article, and then I turned it into a little ten-minute film. And then she replied, you know, and so that kind of. You know, that unexpected encounter, you know, was lovely. And, you know, there was, you know, the, the, there's a sexuality in that film, but it's more a kind of, you know, we're both really interested in, in body, you know, as you could see, you know, and then you just want to have that conversation with another person, you know, and, and, and it's really nice to do it in a formal way. We could, Manny and I could have sat and, had a bottle of wine and talked about that stuff, but it was much better to put it in a form, yeah. you know, and, and, you know, and, and, and that was enjoyable. And, and you learn from that process as well, you know, cause it's, it's, it, you know, there was zero, but like that film was made with literally not a single dollar, not a single penny, you know? So then you think, how do I do something which is creatively satisfying, but has got zero budget, you know? And that in itself is interesting. And you also want to, when you're talking to somebody who is, you know, artistically exciting, then you, you bring your best game, Mm. you know? Yeah. Well, it was it, as the film went on, like it was kind of like you would bring up like the point with the buildings not having any people in it. There's no Jesus in it, right? There's no uh, naked savior. But when she brought up the buildings are the people like that was such a yeah. profound like, like, yeah, like, yeah. wow. Yeah. But that's each kind of bringing the bit. That's a, it was such an in the moment thing. It's so beautiful. Um my uh, so my drummer, his name's Pat Bolin. Um, he texted me a couple of questions, um, and I hey. think this kind of this kind of builds off that like Atomic, which was a film very much like based on music. Uh, my question with that would be like approaching it, kind of working with the band. How is that different than <laughs> your process before? <laughs> you know that was. <laughs> 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 that was that was a lot of fun, you know, because Mogwa and I spent so much time getting drunk <laughs> that you know, they in particular, each time I would show up, they they're in Glasgow and I'm in Edinburgh and I show up and they're you know, they're sort of real men, you know, and I'm sort of what I am. So they would say here they said to me, This is a here's a bottle of your your lady juice, which by which they meant white wine, because I'm the sort of the girl in the team in a way, you know. But anyway, it was it was a lot of fun. I was asked to do that film and they were already on board and um it was lovely. They were because they were so much time having fun and I had to push them really hard mm. for the music, and particularly as musicians, you'll you'll understand this bit. That I knew at the beginning, I needed something with a major chord, you know, because Mogwai's all was minor chords. You yeah, know? yeah. I just said just at the beginning for the first thing, because the profile of this film is we're going to start with a kind of paradise, and then we're going to go to paradise lost, and then it's going to be paradise regained. But please, can you use one minor chord? And they did, <laughs> and. I think it's quite good, you know, you know, just to have this one slightly upbeat piece at the very beginning. Uh, but it was joyous working with them, particularly Barry and, and Berlin, but all of them, you know, Stuart and all of them. Um, I love working with musicians that I've worked with. So, you know, I, I work, I've done a, quite a bit with David Holmes and, you know, brilliant to work with. And, but it was it was great working with them. Very and good. toing and froing because we cut and I would show something. And I think they slightly thought, because they didn't know my work, so I think they think they slightly thought, who's this, you know, fuckwit? And then when they saw when they saw the fact that it was good, then it was like, okay, okay, we're going to make an effort here, I, th- I suspect. That's a, that, I mean, it's inter- that kind of builds off what Pat was asking. Pat wanted to ask, like, are the, what are some of your favorite examples of film deepening music? Deepening music, yeah. That's... Um, so I don't know if f- film deepening music or music deepening film. Sorry, film music deepen- music deepening film. 
Yeah. Um, you know, that's hard to say because, I, you know, it, uh, music should not deepen a film, I think, you know. Music shouldn't take a film down. It should take it left or right, you know, sideways, you know, I think. So, um, it's you know, everybody says this, but it is true that if you're using your music in a film to create an emotion, you're doing something wrong. Mm. But um, I have to say that... A film can sort of create a shape. A music can create a shape to a film that the film doesn't already have. So if you think, for example, Once Upon a Time in the West, in your Morricone's score, you know, when he uh, does that, he understands that a camera rise and an orchestral rise are similar things. So when that happens, that's really good. Um, and one of my favorite films ever is uh, called The Ascent, a Ukrainian film directed by Larisa Shepitko. And um, the composer there was a guy called C-S-C-H-I-T-T-N-E. I think I, I'm sure I'm slightly wrong about that. You know, but once again, what he didn't, what he didn't was deepen the film. He lifted the film. And I think music in a film is better understand as a kind of uh, understood as a kind of hot air balloon. Mm. You know, it makes the film rise. I think. I think, no, I think that's beautiful. Another, another question from him as a drummer, rhythmic, uh, and in film, it's very rhythmic and like, but he, he was asked, he asked if there is a particular rhythmic cut scene or a film that's, uh, uh, has been cut in a really rhythmic way that was inspiring to you or well i think yeah, i think that so percussion and particularly drumming is sort of crucial in a film you know so if you i saw today this um film called saint omar and you know by uh alice diop and there are moments where it's just percussion um when you think of the opening, to go back to the opening of Touch of Evil by Orson Welles, the Henny Mancini, it's, you know, the music, there's a, the jazz bit comes in eventually, but it's, you know, the key thing is that, um, and a film like Code on No One by Michael Haneke, have you seen that one? Yeah. Yeah, so you remember there's, there's a, a tour, you know, at some point in that film, the drums start going boom, 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 and it creates a panic, and you don't know what the panic's for. And it's sort of a social panic about the fact it's, you know, it stars Juliette Binoche, and, but it's also about homelessness. And so that kind of, I think it's a timpani on that one, but I could be wrong, but it's unforgettable. So I, I think that, Drumming, really, you know, the drum is a more important in instrument in cinema than the piano mm. or the violin or the cello. I I definitely agree with that. And it's it's really interesting, like, because it is kind of like time moving in a way. You're like both music and film is 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 motion going kind of back to what we were talking about before. And it's really interesting to like. When, especially when I try to teach rhythm, like visualizing it and feeling it is two things. Like, and it's interesting how much, but when you feel a rhythm, how much it makes more sense, and like how visualizing can help that feeling. Like, if, if it, it's with music written out, which it, it's exactly how this composer thought everything written out. And if, oh man, if we can do that with our emotions as, as people, if just how we feel about a thing, how much would people get, right? And how much would emotion be maybe not as interesting? Like if it was all written out and right clear and clear to everybody. And, and in a cinema, in, in a film, if you've got a lot of stuff going on visually, you don't need a full score. You don't need loads of instruments. You know, it needs to be the opposite of what you're seeing. You know, so if you've got a totally minimal image with no camera moving, nothing happening, then a full score is good. But generally, if there's a lot going on, you need 
just something very minimal and percussive, you know, to cut against, like a to squeeze a lemon on the image, I would say, you know, and 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 so too often we see the image track and the soundtrack just trying to say the same thing, and we don't need that because you think I've already got it. Thank yeah. you very much. You don't need to tell me that twice, you know. Um, yeah. It's it's. But then, but then, but then, when you. You know, when it really works, like like The Umbrellas of Cherbourg. Have you seen that film? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's unforgettable, you know, and, 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 and it's unforgettable that that ending when they're in the petrol station and it, you know, it's the hot air balloon. It the the film just rises and rises and floats and floats because of that music. But that, it's it's also very interesting too that that how the the dynamic that that creates because like when when I when I try to visualize rhythm in a way I see it in a circle and I see like how fast that goes and how where you can place these different durations right. And like thinking of that, like to tell a narrative is a super fascinating way to to emphasize those beats. Like, how, how, is, it, how is it in a circle? So, like, if you think um, in a circle, if we have one complete circle, that's a whole note, right? One way, 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 right? Oh, I see. That's okay. why I'm in. Okay. Like, if it's a half, it's one, two, one. If it's in uh, quarter notes, one, two, three, four, right? And then you fill in these note durations in between and hit these smaller beats. It's kind of like the, the idea, mm -hmm. like because it keeps looping around and how big or how small the circle is, is the speed of it. And like to like, to like uh, see how that, and just hear how you explain how it kind of affects cinematic uh, expression in that way is really, is really fascinating. I th well, I think the general, I don't know if it's related exactly to what you're saying, David, but I think the general rule for me is the longer and slower the shot, the faster the rhythm should be. And certainly if you've got fast cutting, you should not have fast music at the same time. It's just too obvious, you know, and I think so you want a really slow sort of mozzarella attenuated piece to go with the fast cutting. You know, they need to... They, they, you know, I, you know, they, they need to um, not do the same thing. It's as obvious as that. <laughs> I mean, we should have done this naked. This show again. We were talking about it? naked. <laughs> <laughs> um, so with the idea of like um, one plus one equal th equaling three, and like. Hmm? kind of like this idea of these different modes of like expressing like these cuts, like having these contradicting like things, long shot, uh, quick rhythms or quick rhythm, long shot. Um, is it do, with making film, do you find there's a lot of kind of like yin and yang examples of that more than just rhythmic? What does that mean? Sorry. Like, 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 so the idea that the music is super fast when the shot's slow or mm -hmm. the, uh, Shots fast and then the music slow. Do, oh, the contract. Yeah. yeah, is there? It's like a dialectic. Yeah, yeah. What you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. You. So the 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 fascism film. I had planned to use lots of angry music with that film, and I you know selected lots of angry music. And then when we, when I as soon as we tried the first piece of angry music, it really didn't work. Mm. And the reason didn't work is because I was leaving no space for the audience to feel angry, you know, and so the music was expressing an anger which you know, the audience was already feeling and the the music cannot do the job for the audience. If it's trying to do that, then that's a mistake. So um, that I, I found with the Mussolini film, the less music we put on, the better. And so there are big chunks silence in there you know and with the mogwai film as well when on with atomic when we got to the key section about the uh, atrocity of the, the bombing of hiroshima you know you know it would have been very easy for their guitars to go but we didn't we just did sort of almost nothing yeah. i sent them a little 
and just a, and that's all you need a tinkle of a glass a slight sort of buddhist thing almost you know you want you want it's always important uh, that the music cannot be representing the audience it can't do that that's always a mistake i think that's so impactful too because that part in that film when it got to that point my attention was like totally like oh shit you know what i mean like you yeah. feel that impact with that vastness yeah. that that just yeah. the tinkering of that creates and and we and we played that in, you know in hiroshima and chernobyl and you know lots of places you know and i saw it in chernobyl and that point and i saw it in chernobyl and an audience with lots of people who had been in chernobyl during the atrocity you know so i was absolutely dreading it but you know when that moment came there was almost not there's almost nothing in the soundtrack there you know as i say it's like tinkle and it really was a good choice i think because it's interesting without the visual john coltrane has a, a live record he it was his last recording he did before he died and it was in japan and he performed a piece for for the people that went through this and like it was so much noise that it be, it almost became nothing in a way. Like it's so chaotic that it almost mm -hmm. becomes one pitch. And in a way, like what's fascinating about the science of like rhythm, if you speed a rhythm up enough, it becomes one, you yes. know, yeah, yeah, yeah. which yeah, is, yeah, yeah. It, it's the same, with, the same with visuals, you know, if you're cutting so fast, there's a point where you can't see, it just becomes a single event, you know, and yeah. no, that's true. And of course there's a huge value in that. And I love noise. And I personally, when I go to hear and listen to music, I want a overload, yeah. you know, but I think with their images as well, you know, and the image is so powerful, there's a danger that, the music can feel as if it isn't actually listening to the image mm -hmm. and they do need to listen to each other, you know, and respect each other. And so I think that in that case, in that sequence, we knew that almost new mu no music was necessary. Cause like, uh, and, at the, and at the very end, you know, especially when Mogwai played live at the very end, it just goes <clears throat> just such an yeah. over. You know, we had loads of when when we played it here. There were loads of complaints that it was too loud. Um, <laughs> but at the end, once people have gone through that, now is the time to let rip. You know. Yeah. So, but that's like so. Another one, one. Another thing I read. Um, you said that m music touches you in a certain way. Like when you're on a plane listening to Ike and Tina Turner, it brings you the tears that maybe in a way you want film to do or are looking for film yeah. to do. Um, yeah. And I know you've, or at least you've written that you've grown up like listening to like Tammy Wyatt and like country music yeah. and like this, this kind of narrative based music. Is that yeah. like that foundation? Is that kind of what brought these emotions to you and kind of led you to looking for music that was a bit more overstimulating in that way? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, so growing up, up. The Tammy Wynette thing was because I'm from Northern Ireland, you know, we looked west to America. We did not look to England at all, you know, you know, although I, did, I have to say the jam was a, you yeah. know, Paul <laughs> Weller was a thing for me. But on the radio, it was Tammy Wynette. And because I come from a very working class family, you know, there are no intellectuals there. So nobody was listening to Bob Dylan or the Beatles or anything like that. None of that was happening. You know, it was all country music. And so Tammy Wynette was a really big thing. And Elvis was a big thing. And there it was, you know, the, the, this was not a great place to grow up. It was sad. There was a war, obviously, you know. So the fact that you know, the, the music could um, <laughs> make you cry, you know, yeah. music could make you cry, you know, and it was Kitty Lester as well and other stuff, you know, and it was all American stuff. And it would, it would, we all wanted to cry, you know, we were in a war, an actual war, you know, so the, you just needed something to bring out the tears and that did it you know um and i respect that a lot you know even though i wish i had been brought up with more musical influences but i had time to find that but the, that kind of saturation in melodrama really 
fitted, particularly women singers, really yeah. fit, you know, um, those times um, so for me. And then, what, so you mentioned Tammy Wynette. Who, did, who else did you mention? Remind me. Uh, oh, I can Tina Turner. Yeah, so I mean, I can Tina Turner. The particular song I love, like yours, don't go and come knock, knock, knock in every day. You know, it was, you know, when you come from where I come from, a tiny place, and then you fly into New York. And the first time I really listened to that song on the headphones was flying over New York. And I was like 23 and I'd just flown in from like Moscow of all places. And it was overwhelming. You know, you remember the. You remember the words of that song, you broke my heart and you made me blue. You know, it was a, the melancholia. And I already I knew about uh, Tina Turner's life a little bit, but melancholia is an important aspect of music. I think music is better at sadness than cinema is. And there was an example of that. Was it? I definitely agree with that statement. One of my... Uh... One of my jobs during the week is I do a nursing home gig, <laughs> and one in during this in one one's like a performance with the acoustic guitar, right? And the other's like a a DJ gig where they request stuff. And my job is just to say yes. You know what I mean? They all day they hear no. I get to say yeah. We'll play James Brown really loud. Like you know what I mean? Which is always really fun. But I have one one lady who comes out, and every time she asks for this song called "Dance with My Father" by uh, Luther Vandross. Yeah, no, I, I, oh I know. My it. God. And like I, every time I'm fighting back tears, and I'm supposed to be this like, how's it going? You know, entertaining and like, and like, so many times I have to like say no because the rest of the room gets so swept up in the the sorrow that that song brings. And like I've never, you know, th there's a lot of cinema and film that's brought me the tears, but that song in particular, I have to fight every week. It's so potent every time, and like I don't know music like. Musically, as a musician, I should know what it is, but there's just something to that that's so, and maybe it's the environment that I'm seeing how they react to that and how it's hitting them. It's, it's, but it's very well said that it's, uh, music isn't does it, that. Isn't, isn't that lovely? You know that we don't understand our art, our craft. You know, I think that's lovely. You know, we yeah. we do something. We know it's potent. We know that it'll be with us all our lives. You know, we. It's so lovely what you're doing. By the way, you know, you. It's intergenerational. You know that. You know, it shows that it's not only about your age or my age. That you know, people are so touched by this stuff and that's great we don't need to fully understand it you know but it's really really lovely because some uh, very often we just a lot of people feel they just need to f have it externalized their emotions you know and music's yeah. particularly did that and i think like <laughs> like i find myself even sharing this um with with you like the idea of like being in front and not trying to like cry right not trying not trying to lead by example that we're still to have a good time but also to be in it and it's so hard and that maybe kind of reflect really quick on the only time i've really kind of let go in that sense was uh playing a memorial for a friend of mine they asked me to sing at it and it was this tom petty tune wildflowers yeah and like oh my god and like it just I, I broke in the middle of it and just had to like recover and like they came up to me and like said that that was more meaningful that I couldn't handle it the same way they couldn't handle it and that makes me think of the story of looking when there's that scene where you just are seeing maybe better or worse for the first time with your with your surgery done um and like how like potent going back to this nakedness going back to this purity and how like it doesn't you don't need a, a million dollars to make an impactful shot but like the confusion of is are those tears of joy or sorrow and like how impactful that is and like how brave it is to be able to do that. You know what I mean? Like I'm fighting back tears every week. <laughs> and it was, it was just there. Yeah. And it's interesting because I took that mask off and the initial cheer, uh, tears were joy. Yeah. And then, and then I realized it wasn't joy. I, my eyesight wasn't better. So, you know, so it was a scary moment, you know, and um, and it continued to be. Uh, but um, yeah, it was. So you just realize, you know, as a filmmaker, you want to put the camera on yourself. And that's a great thing about, you know, because that was shot on a phone, obviously. And also the technology means that you can get all sorts of intimacies that you couldn't have before, you know, right. and I didn't. 
anybody to, you know, if, if there'd been other people in the room and as I filmed that, it wouldn't, it, it would have been rubbish. But I just thought, I'm going to take this thing off my eye I and let's see what happens, you know. And I was completely on un, unintimidated by that. I was completely un, unaware that I was filming it. I was just looking around the world, around around the room, and thinking, "Fuck, is this better or worse?" You know, you know. And yeah. so that's. I mean, that's great about you know technology. As as Corbusier said, technology is the aesthetic. You know, and that yes. that's that's true. You know, it it it. For better or worse, it allows you to make new forms of cinema or music or anything. And it's, it's sorry, oh, let's cut you off. I was just gonna. Add, I I actually need an eye surgery for a condition called keratoconus. Um, and seeing, okay. seeing what, you, what, what, what called, is that? It's uh the the cornea is um kind of wearing away. It's shaped strange. Okay. Um, so okay. it's like prone to scratching. So I have um blurriness in both eyes. It's. Uh, kind right. of an extension of an astigmatism, um, right? But uh, you know, seeing that film, there, there was like this added uh, kind of um, <laughs> helping me like prepare for that. So if you if you have any like advice for going into eye surgery, <laughs> your, is that treatable so they can fix it? Yes. Yeah, they're gonna. I, I think they take out the cornea and put a dead person's in. <laughs> which is which is also really interesting because I'll have you know oh, that's so interesting something yeah. that somebody else used as a lens to see all their visual yes yes no that's very interesting um I haven't heard of that before but uh, that's so that'll be good uh, you know these eye eye surgery is amazing isn't it like when you think of a lot of this stuff was not doable recently so yeah. it. Of remarkable that they can fix this stuff you know and yeah are you worried about it a little bit yeah yeah mm. if you uh, uh what were some of your like sensations like well doing i know you you showed that image that you painted after and it was very yeah. cool but like so they they give me some sedative and then because i'm quite high anxiety person then they give yeah. me more sedative uh -huh. and then we showed the film here a while ago and my um the anesthetist came, along, <laughs> came <laughs> along and he told me he held my hand the whole way through and he I, apparently i was gripping his hand really hard which i of course don't remember because i was so sedated yeah. but my advice is if they offer you offer you sedation take it okay <laughs> cool <laughs> that's like they, they kind of the kind of the the Build off that. I remember we were talking about that, and you were you wanted to do a film and show them doing the surgery and like the whole idea of the cutting of the eye from yeah. the surrealist movement and the surrealist film. And like, um, it's such a like a beautiful metaphor of seeing something new and digging into something. And like the the fact that you brought that in the story of looking is so cool. And it's such like such a nod to the tip of the hat to that impactful scene and like because i was gonna i was gonna show hope uh the story of looking and but the preference we watched uh uh god well, i can't think of the french word oh uh, uh and thank you yeah. <laughs> I did, and like we watched that and she was like what is going on here it was so cool to be able to see someone react to that yeah but um the idea of like um going back to like technology being like the limits of everything just like how music is completely conditioned differently now because it's fed for this streaming platform this endless amount of space you can have a song that goes for four days maybe um but with cinema too it's interesting like how just even looking and like everyone's looking at highly beautiful like instagram you know what i mean visually augmented things and like how amazing that is to be blown away by something so aesthetically pleasing on your lunch break and then go back to reality. And like how like how it's weird with like film and I don't know if or maybe I should uh, – television, how it's cut in really long 45-minute chunks and you're watching a 13-hour television program that's chopped up in a way that keeps you longing. Like how, how technology is hindered and like kind of blossomed all these beautiful new things that – or how we consume visual and like music media. And like, do you like with like this kind of approach going kind of back and being able just to record these moments as they ha like as they happen, like, do you find like, uh, I, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know if it's a hinder or a hurt that there's like these new, like kind of 
standards of like um, capturing uh, what's it, like like the, the story of film being like the fifteen hour documentary. Like I don't know if when that came out that was like gonna be like the template where now if you watch like Daredevil it's a fifteen hour television show you know it's and it's so set up differently where it's like you're like fed to want to watch this next thing like it's the most impactful parts the last five minutes of those programs right um, I guess my question is um, did you like kind of like of course having it there and ready to go and like the acceptance I guess of like um grandeur media is so wanted but also at the same time the acceptance of like someone recording themselves on their phone just talking about the show they're about to play is a uh, commercial you know what i mean so like this kind of like duality of like extreme polishedness and extreme under polishedness is now mm -hmm. on even playing fields um mm -hmm. i guess my question with that is like is it in your mind? Is that like, is that a good thing? <laughs> I, 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 I want to say yeah. yes, but. So what I think is that, you know, when I started directing it, I, you know, there are no Netflix, obviously there are no streamers, you know? So what, one of the jobs of the director was to keep people watching. So when you're, I worked for TV, for television for a while, just like a couple of years. But when I was working for television, it was always make sure you keep people engaged. So you can't do anything slow at the start. You know, you need to keep it um, fast and you need to tease people. Mm. Always tease them for what's coming up. Those times are gone. And that's good. You no longer need to tease because on Netflix or Amazon, you know, people can fast forward through a boring bit if they consider it boring. Now, of course, I hate that, but it means that my job as a director is no longer to constantly tease. And I'm no longer trying to seduce people with a come on. I've never done that myself, but, you know, I am I am like what. David Lynch says, which is you should uh, float sto slowly into a film. You shouldn't sort of try to dazzle people at the start. It's just like like our conversation or just like meeting somebody in a bar. If you are full on at the start, it's, mm. you know, it's scary. You want a slow build. So I think that the good thing that's happened with the streaming platforms, and I have lots of criticisms of all of that, but it means that as a director, I've got time and I don't need to dazzle people in the first five minutes. Okay. And that's an improvement on what was certainly in my career from what was before. I think like there's, I mean, yeah there's always a question of I mean there's always a standard questions of what do you do what, what's the shape of your film where are the revelations where how do you stay ahead of the audience how do you make sure they're not ahead of you all these yeah. class you know, these are standard things you know I, I definitely want to make sure that I want to surprise people in some way that's why at the end of like life may be I, I use no voice because I thought I cannot say anything after mania yeah. so I'll just use music and stuff like that you know and, and loads of examples of that but i think that um things for the filmmakers are better now than they used to be like when i started directing people people would say to me okay your when i was on in tv they would say people okay your, your film needs to be 58 minutes and i was saying well what if it's 49 or 63 but now of course you could it, you, you can make a four-parter and one can be 43 and one pin can be 67. So that's more creatively satisfying. I was going to say, I think, I think, I think it's just like the idea of music being a conversation and like, that's, that's very inspiring. Cause like when I talk to musicians about like what, what media and what technology is at their exposure and how it's, uh, distributed. Sometimes it's more of a negative thing, but I think it's important to find the positive um, affects of all this new and exciting and like uh, ways to share this work, uh, visual or music. But like, 
my I get my last question, unless you have another one, and Mark, I really. We, I, I don't know how to express how much we appreciate your time. Like, yes, thank this you is so much. So, so cool and so inspiring. Yeah. Um, but to kind of build off the idea of a conversation, um, last night we went and saw this Greek band at um, a small Ohio Inn pub, which is just like, it's a sports bar that has no no sports fans, right? So, and, and they had a Greek band playing, and Greek music's fascinating. It uses all these odd time signatures and all these particular sets of scales. And like, um, but when I was talking with the, the musicians, they were, I was asking one, and he was saying he played in a bluegrass band. I'm like, well, what made it easy to, to switch modes, to switch... Um, how you play that and he said the phrasing and how thinking of how like uh how those lines are sang and how they fit in that rhythm compared to greek music um and i guess with studying film all around the world and making film in different countries do you find the phrasing changes the kind of structure of the film of the language from the language yeah, that's another great question. Yes, of course. Yes, it does. You know, some places in the world, we mentioned earlier that Iran has no tradition of the novel, but it's got loads of poetry things. So that in, that tells us, that explains something about Iranian cinema. If you go to like Georgia and the Caucasus and filmmaker like Parajanov, you know, you some parts of the world have got so many myths and fables and stories that it's inevitable that their cinema moves to a different beat and rhythm, you know, and that's true. That's what happens. And then I go to Japan, you can see something different there, you know, and you can't generalize country to country, but you can certainly say that um, there are different rhythms and poetics uh, in cinema in different parts of the world. Uh, like you know, the, so in in the U.S., for example, the average film is about ninety minutes or hundred minutes. In India, the average film is uh, another almost an hour longer than that. Mm. That's a different time scale. So you you enter the cinema with a different expectation of the experience. Uh, yeah. That's yeah, I, I hear in film school all the time, they say like cinema is universal language or they say the same thing about music. And then you see something like Perijanov and you're like, um, you know, it affects you in such a profound way. But uh, like the color of pomegranates, I cannot tell you like a single thing of what that film is about because, you know, I'm not Georgian. I don't I don't have the same background. And um, yeah, there's just something so profound in it. I, I, I always kind of reject this idea that like, um, these things are universal. I think it's ubiquitous, but maybe not universal. Yeah. But at the same time, we are all of the same tribe. The fact right. that we can have quite a detailed conversation today, even though we've not met and right. we come somewhat different cultures means that we have this common language of cinema and music to a certain extent you know so yeah you're right of course you're right of course but still uh you know we can you can go to georgia and meet a parajana fan and have quite an a deep encounter with that person yeah i hope to do that one day <laughs> Mark, thank you so much for your time, and thank you so much for inspiring us to look and see differently. And so we dearly, dearly appreciate this, my friend. Yeah, thank you. Well, what, what a pleasure for both of you. I really, you know, you've enhanced my day, and it's been lovely talking to both of you, and what a pleasure, and I hope we can uh, meet in real life. Yeah, that'd be wonderful. Yo, Spike Spiegel here. You just listened to Zig of the Gig podcast. Keep riding the bebop. See you, Space Cowboy. Bang.